Atomic weapons are introduced. Today, that is the ultimate reality of this battle plan. In the 5th century BC, the Chinese military philosopher Sun Tzu observed, there are three keys for a nation to be victorious in war. Soldiers willing to do battle, weapons ready for use, and perhaps most important, the wisdom to win without fighting. But wisdom is born of experience. Without war, without enemies to fight, experience must come from training in conditions as real as possible. For a squadron of US Navy F-18 Hornet pilots, the war games are about to begin against a very real and threatening opponent, the Russian-built MiG-29 Fulcrum. For these peacetime pilots, the price of wisdom just went up. It's called Red October. The United States Navy's F-A-18 training syllabus covers all aspects of flying and combat. The fighter weapons phase typically occurs at this training squadron's home field in Virginia or on a detachment to Key West. But some of this year's pilots are about to get an unheard of opportunity, paired with a daunting challenge. It requires one of the longest peacetime flights a Navy fighter pilot will ever make. Nine hours across the Atlantic Ocean to meet the most widely exported threat aircraft in the world, the MiG-29. But these MiGs are different. They are flown by an ally and provide real-world training against the actual threat. Not a computer, not a simulation, and not a Hornet pretending to be the fulcrum, but a living, breathing, real MiG-29 flown by the best trained, most experienced, and toughest Fulcrum pilots on the planet, the German Luftwaffe's 73rd Fighter Wing. Red October is two weeks of training over the forests of the former East Germany, where the first jet aircraft was built. The Navy trains against the MiG-29 because it is the MiG-29 that they will most likely see in combat. Shark one is dead. Shark one is dead. Time. Copy. Shark one is dead. Widely sold by the Soviet Union and then Russia, the Fulcrum is inexpensive. Two aircraft can be had for the price of a single Hornet. Named for Mikoyan and Garovich, the creators of the original Soviet jet fighters, over 1,400 MiGs have been built since 1984, with over half for export. U.S. pilots have seen combat with the Fulcrum over Libya, Iraq, and Yugoslavia. Flown by other nations such as Cuba, Syria, Iran, and North Korea, the Fulcrum represents the prime future airborne threat to American pilots. The chance to see it up close in the mock dogfights of Red October is unparalleled. In a simple comparison, plane versus plane, the Boeing-built Hornet comes out on top. But the advantage over the MiG is less clear when the jets come to the merge, an engagement's initial meeting where the aircraft pass a thousand feet apart at speeds that can exceed a thousand miles per hour. The formations and presentations of the battle may be preset, but the outcome is anything but certain. In the end, it is the quality and experience of the pilots that matters most. Dogfighting is like a knife fight. It is close combat, and nowhere in the world will you find a better MiG-29 pilot than here in Germany. They fight with an Eastern weapon, but have adapted Western tactics. 
Naval Air Station Oceana in Virginia Beach is home to 11 Hornet fighter squadrons, two of which are headed for Red October. VFA-106, a replacement air group or RAG squadron, training new F-18 pilots how to fly while giving veteran Hornet pilots practice on the latest strategies. And VFC-12, an adversary squadron whose role in air combat training is to simulate a MiG-29, duplicating the MiG tactics with the F-18. But a simulated dogfight between two F-18s is like shadow boxing. That's where the U.S. Navy hopes Red October will make a difference. Training to fly against real MiG-29s will take the air combat knowledge and readiness of its pilots to peak efficiency. I was a, against an instructor uh, flying another Hornet, and we ended up two circle on the deck. And one of the things I talk about against a MiG-29 or a higher thrust weight aircraft is it'll translate aft on your canopy. I am looking more over my shoulder as it gets more and more offensive. And uh, uh, you fight another Hornet and you're both kind of just doing this. And this tail say, well, I was translating aft on your canopy. And you're like, OK, sure. Find the same jet. I have no idea. Uh, and, and that was one of that, just one of a small point, but it's something I noticed. And then I got on the deck against a MiG-29 and I watched him go, wow. And I went, that's what translating aft on my canopy is. Since before Sun Tzu's time, the same strategy has been used in training master warriors. The purpose is to prepare them so that by the time they step on the field of battle, they know their opponent's every move before the first move is made. The warrior's knowledge of an enemy becomes so precise that at critical moments he is able to act swiftly on instinct, knowing what to do and what not to do, calmly, without the burden of thought. For the pilots of Red October, gaining real-world knowledge of the MiG-29 fulcrum will sharpen their instinct should they ever face one in combat. F-18 missions rarely last more than two hours. But the nine-hour transland from Oceana to Lager, Germany for Red October is no ordinary mission. To stay focused during the long flight, the pilots keep each other company, talking, even singing Academy fight songs. They wear five layers of clothing should they have to ditch into the frigid North Atlantic. The crossing is so long and so much fuel is needed that two tankers are required. In fact, even the Boeing KC-10 needs refueling. But for the invaluable training of Red October, it's worth it. Your concern is the uh, update on the weather. We, uh, the, we the weather latest weather we had is about an hour. Now. The first wave of F-18s flew through Hurricane Michael, forcing them to refuel several times under difficult conditions. Understood, sir. And the uh, weather is uh, getting worked by the other jet. This second cell departs the next day and finds clear skies. Uh, stand by with that. Let's get this guy in the basket, then we'll talk. Drawing within 50 feet of the KC-10 at 400 miles per hour, with a fuel basket dancing in a crosswind, the in-flight procedure looks difficult, but for the pilots, it is a welcome break from the monotony of flying in formation. F-18s have limited internal fuel capacity, so-called short legs. Each jet is outfitted with three external fuel tanks, maximizing their range at nearly 1,400 nautical miles. Each Hornet will use 4,700 gallons of fuel, enough for a car to drive each of the 50,000 miles of interstate in the United States three times over. In order to preserve enough fuel to reach a divert base, off their tanks six times while crossing the Atlantic. The fuel flows quickly. In a single minute, the tanker transfers as much gas as a typical American car needs for a year. Compared to the aerial war games waiting for them in Red October, the Translant is an endurance test. But there are no complaints. Bragging rights come with flying nine hours in a Hornet, and pilots will wear it like a medal. Roger, go ahead, disconnect. Open that. 
A dogfight can be over in the blink of an eye. The pilots record the action as seen through the heads-up display. After the flights, the videotapes are reviewed. That's when the kills are validated and the tactics are evaluated. Here, Caesar explains what happened on his mission. Okay, what we're looking at here is uh, I'm approximately 50 degrees nose low, inverted, and uh, I think one of the interesting things about BFM is, uh, you know, we're pretty much people, horizon's good, level's good, you're driving your car. Uh, once you're in a fight, you have no idea which way is up. You get fleeting glimpses of the ground, the sky. Uh, I had no idea which way I was heading. I knew my altitude, I knew I was 50 degrees nose low, and I knew where the hard deck was, i.e. our minimum altitude. Now in combat, our minimum altitude would be the ground but that's a little dangerous to train to. In, our, in this case, our minimum altitude is 8,000 feet uh, because of the floor of our operating area. But I know I've got plenty of altitude and I'm pushing them around offensively uh, here that, uh, that, I, that I feel like I can do anything I need to do. And here I am inverted, coming through 50 degrees nose low. Uh, I've got G right here, I'm under 3.2 Gs. Apologize for the quality of that. And I've got my time in here, which is good for reconstruction purposes. And I'm at 2,100 feet of range and 240 knots velocity, or V sub C, we call it, closure. Um, in this instance, I don't have a radar lock on a MiG-29 uh, with guns selected, and this is our uh, funnel. Uh, the radar's not getting a lock, but the funnel means that bullets, if I pull the trigger, are coming out, and as I transcribe through the sky, through that arc, the bullets are, are, are going down through there. And if I do pull the trigger with a, with a radar lock, it switches from the funnel to the director mode. I've got a TD box, target designator box that says, hey, the target's in there. Actually, it's a little bit lagging right there. And this is where my pipper is right now. If I pull the, uh, if I pull the trigger, that's where the bullets will go. So my job is to maneuver this out in front of him uh, along his flight path and just, uh, and just rake him over the coals. So, uh, so we're, we're working those low here. Let's go ahead. Trigger down. OK. Right there was one fleeting. It's a radar lock, uh, but it's a snapshot. Uh, what we mean snapshot, I mean it is instantaneous quick shot. It's a valid snapshot from the aspect is I'm, I'm pulling the trigger a little early here, but I'm seeing his flight path coming this way. I'm trying to bring the director reticle down uh, and, and to intersect his flight path. So if you watch closely, there's the event marker. The trigger's down. I'm spraying bullets in front of him. And right there, not a great shot, but I did take out about three or four feet of his left wing tip. Will that affect him? Yeah, I think so. But uh, I'm just spraying bullets downrange here. Again, the fangs are out. I'm, I'm really, you know, it's a MiG-29. It's a Fulcrum, and here I am fighting them. And uh, I'm not really uh, disciplined on my trigger. Don't have a ton of bullets, 578 uh, bullets in this case. These are all simulated here. But you don't want to be sitting here hosing bullets on downrange. We shoot at 4,000 rounds per minute, uh, four to 6,000 rounds per minute. And uh, that'll go really quickly. So, so there he is. Yeah, I've just gunned him once. So he's, he's half dead in, in this case. We continue. Here comes the fight. You can see now what he's doing. He uh, initially tried to defeat my gunshot, and uh, we're only about 1,300 feet apart, and he's just trying to get above me and pull into me. And what might, might cause is an in-close overshoot, and what happens there? Boom, shalem, low call. Here comes the archer. I'm dead. And that, that's a BFM error. Uh, I think what I do here is I unload slightly, let him translate up, and, uh, up into the right to the horizon, get some energy back, and follow him back on up. And this right here is what makes it all worth it. Um, you know, to be able to come back from the debt and have a pipper right on the cockpit uh, with the trigger down and this guy pretty much blowing up right in front of you is, is ma makes the debt worth it. I could go home now. You know, it's only been three days. Pilots have trained against the MiG-29 and even fewer have faced it in real combat. Its reputation as a deadly adversary is legendary and for nearly all the pilots of Red October, this exercise is their first chance to see the fulcrum up close. Here we're standing in front of a MiG-29, the German version of a MiG-29. Uh, the German Air Force got this aircraft in 1990, right after unification. The East German forces had 24 of these jets and the West German Air Force, <coughs> of course, took over all of those aircraft. It was a very, very interesting aircraft uh, to German Air Force and to NATO in general because it was the first Russian aircraft that had the maneuverability to counter the modern uh, NATO jets and it had a new radar, a pulse Doppler radar, that was capable of uh, detecting low-flying aircraft.
When the MiG-29 first appeared, its radar was reputed to be equal, if not superior, to the Hornets. The Luftwaffe MiGs dispelled that rumor to the great relief of the West. But the Fulcrum proved to have a few tricks up its sleeve. Most fearsome for the Hornet pilots is the MiG's helmet-mounted sight, a retractable reticle with a heads-up display for the Archer infrared missile. The F-18 has nothing comparable. An American has to point the nose of the Hornet at the opponent to achieve missile lock. But in the MiG, the pilot merely turns his head. For the Americans, the Schlem radio call means the end. If you take a closer look at the aircraft, we find uh, the cannon, which is right here. It's a very big cannon. It's a 30 millimeter cannon. And right in front of the aircraft, we can take a look at the ammunition. This would be the typical load of the gun. It's 150 rounds. When you compare it to the Hornet, the Hornet carries a couple hundred. These rounds are a lot bigger. So if you need, you need just one of these rounds to <laughs> blow up a Hornet, while the Hornet would need several rounds to blow up a MiG-29. The gun is still a a very valuable uh, weapon in the uh, dogfighting today. It's the only weapon that you cannot jam or decoy with, uh, with other decoys. While the Hornet may have superior slow speed maneuverability, the Americans are dazzled by the Fulcrum pilot's final surprise. In the very back of the aircraft, we have uh, two very powerful engines. <coughs> And a very important aspect in dogfighting is to have a lot of thrust. It is best to have more thrust than the, the aircraft weighs. So we're talking about a thrust to weight ratio bigger than one, which would theoretically allow the aircraft to climb straight up like you've probably seen before. And this helps us to keep up the speed when we're flying tight turns, fighting, for example, a Hornet. And that's why we have a, a very, very slight advantage of, over most of our opponents. Being a fighter, the aircraft, of course, needs, needs something to shoot. We, we not only just want to fly around, our task is to shoot down other aircraft. And therefore, we have not only the gun, but also missiles. And here we have uh, an older infrared version. It has an infrared seeker head, which is looking for heat sources, mainly for the engine exhaust, which is normally very high temperature. So this seeker head will lock onto the exhaust of the target aircraft and then steer itself toward the aircraft. It's a so-called fire and forget missile. The second missile we have is the so-called Archer. It's also an infrared missile. It's a fire and forget missile also. So it will lock onto the heat source of the enemy target, of the enemy aircraft. And this is uh, the missile that makes the MiG-29 so dangerous in close-in dogfights. Whenever we get uh, close with other fighters, we have a big advantage due to this missile because the Zika head can look very far to the sides and lock up targets uh, where other missiles would not be able to do this. The MiG-29 also carries a radar missile. It tracks targets similarly to the Hornet's AMRAAM, but with range. Out at range, we had a very big disadvantage and have to think of, uh, of uh, crazy tactics to get close to the Hornets and then use our superiority with the short-range weapons we have and the maneuverability. In contrast to the physically demanding MiG, the F-18 is flown on stem power, as in brain stem. It means being able to pilot the Hornet the same way they're able to breathe or walk, without having to think about it. They have the advantage of technology, fly-by-wire controls, and the glass cockpit, where computer-driven displays have replaced dozens of steam gauges. You may hear that the issue of speed in a, in a fighter jet is incredibly important in order to get somewhere, and that is true. But the best thing about the Hornet is its slow speed handling characteristics. It's very forgiving, it's very dynamic, you can get slower, faster than any other airplane. What that allows me to do though is to point my nose at the bad guy and take him out with a missile or a gun. The intentionally unstable design of the modern fighter jet allows the superb performance and maneuverability of the Hornet. Computerized flight controls keep the jet in the air but they aren't lightning-fast supercomputers. They are comparable to early 1980s-era desktops. 
albeit ones that can withstand 7.5G turns, hundreds of carrier landings, and still never freeze up. Back here, probably one of the keys to the Hornet performance besides the leading edge and trailing edge flaps is the stab. It's an all-moving stabilator, differential as well, helps with roll control and uh, pitch authority. The F-18 Hornet has probably the best pitch rate of any aircraft out there. So much so that you could almost gray yourself out or black out under the commanded G-forces if you're at a high enough airspeed. A classic dogfight requires a close-range weapon, the 20mm M61 Vulcan cannon. But beyond visual range, the Hornet, with its advanced radar capability, is superior to the MiG. An AMRAM can be launched at an opponent many miles away, well before either pilot could make a visual identification. We've got nine stations on the aircraft, two on the wing, one on the center line, two on each cheek, and then the uh, wingtip station. This gentleman and uh, lady are about to download an AIM-9 CATAM, a captive air training missile from aircraft station nine. In red October, the AIM-9s won't be real. The computer will simulate these short-range Sidewinder's capabilities when the pilot pulls the trigger and calls Fox 2 on the radio. Besides actually carrying weapons, probably the most important station on a Hornet is the left cheek station. Left cheek station, while we're in combat, about 99% of the time carries a, a FLIR pod. That FLIR pod is paramount for getting battle damage assessment, for lasing for targets, acquiring targets, responding to tasking, and uh, it is not loaded on our rag jets, but every fleet bird that goes out on deployment will have one of those, and that is our bread and butter. So taking off from the carrier landing on the carrier makes you a cool Navy pilot. Having your FLIR allows you to get the BHA to actually employ, as we're, as we're told to do, and allow you to use those smart weapons. force on earth a loyal ally relentless peacekeepers a force to be reckoned with now the ritual never varies the signals between the pilot plane captain and ground crew are part of a well choreographed ballet that emphasizes safety red october is more than just training for pilots nearly the entire squadron goes to laga 150 ground crew, maintenance staff, and support personnel. They practice the takeoff and landing procedures and perform maintenance and support under real world conditions. While executing the basic fighter maneuvers called BFMs, the pilots communicate with each other and the ground controllers by radio, using words such as crank, notch, flow, and flank, top secret codes for specific offensive and defensive maneuvers. Temple times two, kudos notch right, reference one five zero. Just as few pilots have ever flown with a MiG, few civilians have ever heard these tactical calls. Red October affords many prized opportunities. On this flight, Lieutenant Dave Koss call sign Mongo, an instructor pilot with VFA 106. I waited my whole life to do that, and I'm a little sad it's over. It was, I'm always studying the capabilities of the airplane, and I got to see it, and it was eye-watering. It was amazing. Who won? Uh, one for one. He got the first one, I got the second one. So, at least I learned something. So you're starting out. Zero, six, zero, heading. At the debrief, Mongo meets with Major Fred Schmidt, his MiG adversary pilot. Also in attendance, Lieutenant Spanko Hamlin, a VFC-12 adversary pilot who got a backseat ride in the MiG on this flight. 
Today, Mongo and Fred had two engagements against each other. The debrief covers every detail of both flights, from their departure plan, to the tactics used, to the actual BFM. Breaking down the first engagement, Fred illustrates what happened. The red arrows are the actions of the Hornet. The MiG is in blue. They mark the headings, the missile shots, the nose direction of the jets, even the velocity and relative energy packages of the engines. The first engagement ended with Mongo crashing into the hard deck, the simulated ground. You are going through the floor. Tough luck. So the second setup. Now Fred outlines the second engagement. The two-seat MiG is slower and less maneuverable than the single-seat model. This limited the extreme high-G turns that Fred would normally have used. Mongo was able to force him through the hard deck, defeating the MiG. Yes. So on this one, actually, after the second scissor, I'm checking the floor. Both engagements ended with the pilots breaking the hard deck, an 8,000-foot buffer between a training mistake and a very real disaster. And giving me a lot of problems coming around. I'm I didn't really realize the full extent of how dangerous it was, and it is dangerous. And I've I've lost quite a few of my friends. I can count at least 13 who I've lost to the business. So you have to realize there's an element of danger in it. Uh, the things I got out of it were the helmet mounted sight and the archer. That scares me, and I uh, have newfound respect for it. And then exactly like you said, a high OA slow airspeed is my fight. And seeing with how much power you have, even at the end there, you might be able to power through that. Whereas I can maintain high alpha, I have no airspeed. You can just plug the blowers and go somewhere else. So I think that's what I learned today. You guys do have the power that we, we thought you did. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that thank you. It. That was awesome. I had a blast. Thanks. Thanks. U.S. military pilots are involved in at least one accident per week on average. Most occur during training missions. During today's sortie, one of the pilots crosses the line between simulation and reality. It's called a departure from controlled flight. Looking through the heads-up display, the Hornet peaks at over 16,000 feet, and its airspeed drops to less than 50 miles per hour. The jet begins falling like a leaf from a tree towards the Earth, except the Hornet falls 10,000 feet. Only the pilot's training and the F-18's computer allow him to regain control, but only after crashing into the simulated ground. Fortunately, the incident occurred at Red October. The pilot will live to fly another day. Should he ever face a MiG in real air combat, he will know the risk of attempting a similar vertical maneuver. Or we are about the only squad in, in the NATO or Western world that has MiG 29s. Uh, we have them in Lager. So we're the sister squadron flying the F 4s. I'm very lucky to have them there because they attract all the uh, a lot of uh, other squadrons that are coming over for DACT, that is dissimilar air combat training. So also we, the Phantom Squadron, uh, the second fighter squadron, um, we are, have a lot of benefit from that too. And uh, for us, it's, it's awesome training. The Germans know their special place in the fighter pilot world and love the opportunity to demonstrate their abilities. Boing. But Red October is intended to be a training detachment for the American students. The U.S. instructors require the Germans to present specific combat scenarios, even placing restrictions on their tactics in order for the students to complete the training syllabus. Today we were going to fly a one a F-18 together with me, plus a two additional F-4s, and we're going to fly against two other F-18s with uh, varying scenarios, and um, they have put a few handcuffs to uh, what we are doing, but um, it's going to be an all-altitude and uh, full-up war, basically. 
The restrictions placed on the engagements are a necessary evil, but sometimes without warning, the fulcrum pilots deviate from the plan and change tactics to fool the students. The Germans are proud. They are the best aggressor pilots in the West, and they want to show what they can do. From, from every flight and uh, the thing is uh, the MiG is not the most sophisticated system so what we learn is just how to defend versus the good weapons in the NATO stock and uh, how to perform the MiG to the max extent. The hotter the hot. The next mission, a 2v4. Two Hornets are headed for an engagement with four adversary aircraft. As the instructor, Mongo flies wing. The lead pilot is a Category 3 student, Lieutenant Commander Tim Carr, call sign Cowboy. Their challenge? Track and kill multiple targets at long range. Cuda 2 on flight ready for takeoff. Roger, Cuda 2 on, wind is 230 degrees at 8 knots, you're cleared for takeoff, report leaving way. 2 on, welcome. Unlike a 1v1 dogfight, today the engagement with the enemy will begin at long distance, beyond visual range. The view we have right now is the same formation. You, if you can imagine, we're flying this way right now, and the camera's right in front of us, pointing back at us. So we're looking at both of us from a, me, more of a head-on view, him from kind of the side. And when I'm flying in formation, you can see my aircraft back in there. So that's kind of what we're looking at. We're at about 5,000 feet. Uh, this layer is about 3,000 feet thick. And it's pretty much clear above 8,000 feet on this flight. We can train down at those low altitudes, but we burn a lot of gas. So we like to get up on top of it, get a lot better gas mileage up there. Now we're just accelerating. We're going to get a G-warm. That's, that's a maneuver we do just to put some G-forces on the jet to get our bodies used to fighting under high G-loads. It's required before doing any ACM. It's two 90-degree turns, just uh, four Gs in the first one, and then six Gs in the second one. Gives me a chance also to lock onto my wingman with my weapon system and get my weapon systems checked because he's been able to do that on the join up. When you hear that tone, it's just uh, I've selected my weapon system as we're getting ready to pull into this G warm. A rough ride on a roller coaster will reach 5 G's for a few seconds. Anything more would cause an immediate loss of consciousness. Training and a G suit keep the pilots safe at up to 7.5 G's. Yeah, the G-warm, like you said, is just to get our bodies acclimated to it. And no kidding, the more Gs you pull, the better at it you get. And also checking to make sure that our G-suit is plugged in. You can feel the pressure on your legs that it is inflating. That's the standard call. We've told everybody we're set up where we are. The band is called Set in the South. We get our tapes on call, so we're recording uh, our radar picture and HUD picture. And call the fights on. And and start heading at them. Picture, two groups, Azimuth 5, Western group, Bulls, 175, 13, 17,000, flanking north, northeast. 
He's basically just told us we've got two groups. Anytime somebody's more than a few miles apart, they call them a separate group. And now he's told us there's two of them. And I've just picked up this uh, near group that's on my radar. I've asked GCI to declare that group, whether they're friendlies, hostile, or unknown, uh, which would be bogeys. And they declared them hostile. I was kind of expecting bogeys. So I'm going to ask for another declaration here just to make sure they're the bad guys. We've already targeted into this group. Yeah, but they are taking shots into this near group. Different mindset. When you when you get a bogey call, you can't shoot those guys. When you get a bandit call, you can shoot them. So if they call them bogey, we have a totally different mindset going in. We're not shooting long-range missiles. Whereas if they call them bandit, we're shooting long-range. Again, bogey, you can't shoot them until you visually ID that they are a bad guy. Hike range 12 to McDonald's. Pitbull times two. Kudos notch right. Reference 150. This, uh... We've supported our missiles for a while here. Now we're doing some defensive maneuvering. We're in a... We're looking good here. <laughs> Very good. Very good. <laughs> we're both upside down, pulling about five Gs, uh, going real nose low, getting into the notch. The warbling tone you hear means that they have targeted a missile into us, but this should... Hopefully, uh, our defensive tac tactics are going to work, and we'll be able to come back in off of this. We descended probably about 10,000 feet in, you know, five to 10 seconds. Just, it's a pretty aggressive maneuver. It's a lot of fun. It takes a lot of practice to get your fingers moving where they need to be while you're doing it. We're trying to maintain that same formation while we're maneuvering the jet five or six Gs, trying to get our radar looking in the right piece of sky so that we come back to get these guys. Hopefully our sensors pick them up before our eyeballs have the ability. You can't kill somebody you don't see. And if your sensors don't pick them up, then you need the eyeball to do it. Uh, we had good missiles into this group. We were feeling pretty offensive. We were on our timelines, and things were going along pretty good. We could have done a better job cleaning up this merge, but we had high confidence in our lethality going in, so we decided to flow on to the next group here. And there's another group about 20 miles away that GCI has told us about, so we're flowing in their direction. Situational awareness. It's your overall sense of what's going on. So if you have high SA, you pretty much have that picture we talked about earlier in your head. If you have low SA, you can be what we call tumbleweed, where you're the tumbleweed blowing in the dust, where you don't see anybody, you're not talking to anybody. I'm a little tumbleweed here, and you're helping me out by making calls. He's engaged with a couple of F-4s here. I'm trying to regain sight of him. And uh, his engaged communications are allowing me to get my head back where it needs to be to see him and pull back in with him. We just came in with two F-4s. They came in at an altitude split. So I'm going to split off and go for the high one. And shortly thereafter, we're going to pick up the low one. That tone you hear is me getting a lock on this guy. And I just killed one of the F-4s. And Cowboy will take care of the other F-4. Let them turn low. Copy, Now we're just, you can see if you can see us looking around, making sure we're not going to hit anybody. Because there's been four airplanes in really close proximity doing a lot of turning here for a couple of seconds. And let's terminate this. Confirm, terminate. Kudu 2 on terminating. Two, 2 terminating. Michael, I copy, terminate. For two weeks, Red October has taken the Hornet pilots through a training regimen of simulated 29. They've been challenged to a first-hand experience against the MiG-29. They've been challenged to evade its weapons, forced to confront its vertical thrust maneuver, dared to defeat it in both long range and close combat. We did what we set out to do. Uh, we validated our tactics and I'm comfortable knowing that if I launch off the ship in this jet, I can take it up against the best the enemy's got to throw at us. I'm going to dig inside the turn and bleed a little bit, trying to get back up to The it. lessons learned at Red October are too valuable to be left in the debriefing rooms. He has to come off and get a little bit. I'm actually going to dig down inside the turn. In between flights, the pilots swap their war game stories with a mix of adrenaline and relief. They reenact their successes and their failures 
And uh, he comes down and he starts popping stuff that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Live and learn. Yeah, I got to buy work cut out for me. Yeah, it's just pretty impressive. <laughs> the exchanges may be part bravado, but there is no mistaking something new in their eyes. A clear look of self-awareness. German pilots, this exercise may be over, but their role continues. They alone can provide this type of realistic adversary training. They are sharing their wisdom. If you look at history, and the history of the Vietnam War, if a pilot got through his first 10 missions, he had a higher probability of surviving. And it's interesting that this is something similar to uh, the Air Force program Red Flag, where they try to simulate those first 10 missions so that when a pilot goes into combat for the first time, yes, it's truly his first mission in combat, but hopefully he has 10 other missions to fall back on and increase his chance of surviving. Flying in Red October, the American pilots have passed a critical entrance exam for survival, should they ever have to face a MiG-29 when the air combat is real.